places you go. Uh, so the last event, I had like a half a dozen people come up to me, uh, but they were all kind of friends. So it's like, you know what, let me get another batch in the next event. Uh, so if you're interested and you don't know how to get into the space, then it's really, it could be any skill set. Like, I'm not going to take an expert and go to whatever, but salespeople or artists or whatever it is, uh, I think it, it was really great back in the day, uh, pre-COVID, some of those teams actually became companies. Uh, so uh, I definitely am excited to keep that going. Um, and then future presenters. Uh, so we're always looking for exciting content. Um, I'm actually on the head of the game with November, uh, so I almost have a, a pretty full um, agenda. So it's Echo 3D, uh, who's been around a long while, great platform. Uh, Verdi is a healthcare uh, VR simulation uh, company, and I think everyone knows Shapes XR. If you don't know Shapes XR, uh, get on it. They have a, an amazing platform for prototyping experiences, uh, and they're going to be in town. Um, so uh, have you know, I can always squeeze more in, um, and I always like to try and put as much great content up here as possible. Uh, so if you or if you know somebody who's working in the space and has something, hit me up. Um, even if I don't have the time to get you up on stage, I kind of have an open policy for demos, and to be frank, I just want to fill the room with VR demos. Uh, that, that would be my preference, so come on down. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then we have a couple of announcements, and some of the folks are here. So the XR Guild has an event on Tuesday, September 26th at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, Gene in the back there has more information. Uh, Yvonne's uh, group ANNY, they meet third Tuesday of every month at the Gutter Spare Room in Williamsburg. Uh, that is how you spell it. <laughs> we, we were not sure. <laughs> Horrible New York City. Um, and then uh, we're putting together a eighth wall workshop. Uh, it's gonna be sometime in November. Uh, Peter here uh, is helping to organize that event. Um, we're actually looking for venues for it. Uh, so if anybody knows of a venue, it'll be up over a weekend. Um, and if you, any, if you have any questions or whatever, hit up Peter, but I'll, I'll post more information on the meetup site. Um, and then the last thing is uh, Ilya is gonna be presenting uh, of time. Uh, they also have a coupon code, it's NYVR, um, Ilya back there, we'll talk more about it uh, during the, his presentation. Okay, uh, so this is our amazing lineup tonight, we've got Ilya, Yvonne, Brian, and David, and I'm going to stop talking and hand it off to Ilya. So, uh, where we started, we started with VR simulation, actually. Um, we ran, since 2016, 2017, we ran um, super advanced simulation center here in downtown Manhattan, and our focus was basically racing simulation and flight simulation. Racers, pilots will come to our place to train, to perform in real life. That was kind of the idea there. As we were running the center, we also experienced lots of people running into the walls while using virtual reality, and that's how we started working with the um, omnidirectional treadmill. So we, because we had this genesis, kind of you know past experience of building motion simulators. By the way, I didn't mention all these guys who build labs, designing little labs. So uh, because we had this experience, right, we wanted to build an amazing omnidirectional uh, treadmill for home use, basically. Mm -hmm. And David and I. We worked on it for quite a long time, and we quickly realized we'll not be able to do it within the coming 20 years, or something like that, right? So, but the good news were we had a motion engine software which was in charge of like performing basically function of connection between our imagined treadmill and the headset. So we used this motion engine for a completely different market. 
So it just happens that I'm into running, like real life running, and um, I realized that there is like a huge ecosystem of existing hardware, which is fitness treadmills, and they can be easily used without software. So that's how Actoni came, came to life and let me move. So what are we trying to solve here, right? So we're trying to solve the problem many people have when they exercise with the fitness machine, specific treadmill, notorious for like monotonous. Um, and you know, obviously, uh, some companies did a great job in making like screens bigger, but it doesn't really solve the problem of like you know, for instance, social aspect of things, right? Even if we're training in a class with, you know, let's say, Peloton, it's still pretty important class. It's not your real life interaction. And in our belief, we can change it with virtual reality. So there is definitely this potential. So that's what we're doing here. Basically, the two elements here and here, the off-clock, these are the hardware elements which we are not covering, right? So it's treadmill coming from our partners and the headset, right? Which is a mobile headset, and this is Meta, Pico. Uh, what Actoni brings to the table is actually the software part of it. The most important element I've already spoke, uh, talked about, motion engine, basically it allows you to connect to the treadmill wirelessly, and it allows you to control the treadmill from virtual reality. Um, and last but not least, it allows to do this all in a safe way. Right? And we'll talk more about safe content platform, our worlds. Right now we have 10 worlds to run in, and obviously the plans are to expand it. Uh, VR Social Hub is something important. We have up to eight people in multiplayer right now, so you can meet with your friends um, from around the world in, on the same trail and basically run together. And finally, a performance board, pretty standard, something that, where you can track your progress. So I'll move on. So uh, the Actoni can be used in three major modes. Uh, virtual reality mode when the VR basically covers your whole field of view, right? This is pretty straightforward that we, we, we all used to. Um, at least those of us who are into VR. And there is augmented reality mode, which is something like, I call it the Apple way, <laughs> right? Where we're basically not taking you away from uh, the real world. We're saying, you'll see the whole real world, and then you can bring a small window, or a big window if you want, into virtual reality. Basically, we allow you to change the size of the screen, which provides you the view of the virtual world, and its position, and curvature, and stuff like that. And I guess the last one is the one DJ really likes, uh, mixed reality, right? So mixed reality is kind of the best of the two worlds. And I'll just outline one important thing here, right? So you see the virtual world here still, right? But you also see through, we allow you to basically kind of you know, cut out the window in the real world and to see your virtual, oh, I'm sorry, physical trend. Right? You can grab it. So whenever people are asking us about safety, we're saying, well, we're not taking you away from your treadmill. You're on the treadmill, you see the treadmill, you can touch it. That's all cool. But the rest of it can be virtual reality. So that's kind of how the uh, how, um, software works. Uh, real quick about connected, non-connected mode. So I mentioned before, you need to connect in order to control the treadmill. Right now, we're supporting 40 treadmill brands, 200 models roughly 200 models, which is still way to go. There is much more to cover. Um, uh, with that said, there is also non-connected mode, and most of our users right now actually I still use a non-connected mode. And this one, basically, to give you an idea, in order to, uh, the main thing here is synchronization of the speed in virtual reality with the speed in the real world, right? If you don't synchronize it, what happens, we all know, Right, so <laughs> uh, in non-connected mode, in connected mode, you don't need to worry about it. The speed of the treadmill will be aligned exactly, precisely. Whatever, like you make one inch move in VR, you'll get the same one inch move on a treadmill. In non-connected mode, you're in charge of manually adjusting the speed on the treadmill and then adjusting the speed in VR. I'll, I'll not talk about non-treadmill mode, but it's basically if you don't have access to the treadmill, you can use it. Um, real quick about safety, so. All our treadmill manufacturers partners, the first question they ask, safety. How the hell you can, you can run with a brick on your face, you're gonna fall, and then there will be legal cases in the worse than Peloton, and so on and so forth. So basically, uh, the premise here is this. Um, we can actually make an experience that is more safe 
can run without the headset. And here's how. Uh, on one hand, we are not taking you from the real world. You can always see the treadmill through the pass -through. On the other hand, uh, the headset is actually tracking your position on the boat at any given moment. So what our safety system allows to do is basically, if you are going too far on the boat in any direction, it can, it's going to tell you right away. It's going to provide uh, like, um, uh, like voice command and the text command, right? And if you are doing too bad there and you're still not listening, then we can shut down the trap, right? So these are the, just a couple of things that we actually patented, like 20 innovations patented here. So um, moving on real quick, I, I don't want to bore you guys with the business stuff. If, however, like anybody has questions about investments or like, you know, how we do go to market, feel free to ask during the Q&A or in person later. But basically we have three channels, direct to consumer, we're selling for uh, Meta, Pico Store right now, and we hope to be on Apple Store, obviously, super excited about it. Fitness equipment manufacturers. So the beauty of going with these guys here is that they have ready customer, right? They have their people who already have the treadmill. So the only problem here, over here we have a problem of making people actually get in the treadmill, right? Getting access to the channel over here, the opposite problem, getting the headset. Right? And finally, over here, hopefully, we don't have any problem. And the reason being is because fitness clubs, basically, let's say, you know, uh, on any market right now, there is concern $3,500 for Apple Vision Pro headsets, super expensive. What is happening here with the gym if 40 people are using the same treadmill? That means you take the price of the headset divided by 40. And that's your price per user, which is basically nothing, right? And that's why we're very excited about this specific direction of kind of developing our own uh, marketing channels. So over here, I'll be real quick. Um, uh, probably most of people in this audience know this stuff, and hopefully you support what is here. But basically, the idea is this: headsets are becoming lighter and smaller. Um, we still don't know the weight of this guy, but hopefully it's going to be not that bad. And eventually, um, no doubt, it's not comfortable. It's not like your natural running, running with the headset on. But eventually, it's going to get there. There are no technological limitations why it will not get there. It's just a question of surviving until we get there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, real quick, um, kind of headset performance evolution again. Things we are excited at Act 20 about is this number, 12 million pixels, right? The reason why we're excited about this number is because this is your photoreal, closed photorealistic worlds, and that's what many people ask us about. Like, people from coming from Supernatural are saying, where are the same worlds as in Supernatural, right? And this, together with the M M2 processor, hopefully will allow us to get there, right? Uh, so, moving on, roll the head. Um, almost done here, by the way. So basically, we, we nailed the treadmills. By far the hardest problem in kind of in VR for fitness machines. And now pretty much our motion engine can be adapted for bikes, elliptical machines, rowing machines, and stuff like that. So that's one way how we can horizontally develop. Uh, second, obviously, I've already mentioned the social part of it, but basically, my dream uh, is to have like New York Marathon. <laughs> right, that would be the goal. We're very far from it, eight people at this point, right? Now multiplayer, but we can get there. At, at least there with our chief of uh, technology prime. <laughs> he didn't specify the time. Uh, anyways, um, final kind of point I wanted to kind of leave you with is that, you know, one thing that we're really excited is obviously providing the variety of worlds. What we're imagining in a few years from now is a globe that you see when you are like getting into Arctonic, you rotate the goal and you pick the spot anywhere around the world where you can run, right? You click on it, you buzz your friends, you join with your friends, and you run in the same place which looks just like real world, okay? So that's pretty much all, um, thank you. A uh, quick couple of announcements here, right? So um, DJ already mentioned, if you guys wanna download, it's free download, you can always try it, non VR, non treadmill mode, treadmill mode. Um, if you want to buy some of the content, it's a membership or just a la carte. You can just click and buy VR and you'll get a special discount. Um, if anybody here got so excited that you want to try it in real life with our team, we're actually doing demo days. 
in the coming two weeks. Uh, we're working with Peloton, but we're also kind of just inviting in, in enthusiasts. So please drop us a line, support at actonicvr.com, and we'll arrange a demo for you. Okay, and finally, when we are done here, if you want to talk to us, obviously feel free to come over. So David, over there, and Nayan. David is uh, our CTO, Nayan is our Chief of Strategy and Business. So if you have any business questions, talk to them. At least to Nayan, for sure, not to David. Um, <laughs> any other questions to me, which is pretty much within me, without questions. So, okay, I'm done here, guys. Uh, Q&A, hopefully, some questions. He's, he's like an important yeah. person, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, you have a, a gaming aspect in the treadmill, as well as I think there's a travel idea also, right? Mm -hmm. Which one do you think are you more excited that people will resonate with? Yeah, so, um, yeah, roughly half of our experience are gaming experiences right now. You can kind of shoot things, grab things and stuff, and half of them are recreational experiences. So far, we've seen much more interest, at least more voices are coming from people who want photorealistic recreational experiences with their friends. So it doesn't seem like, um, this. so there's, there are two problems, right? One problem, converting gamers into fitness enthusiasts <laughs> and fitness enthusiasts into uh, kind of gamers. Yeah. So the second group is doing better right now. <laughs> right? Yeah. Is is there any discussion to develop your own hardware so it can better accommodate your service? Yeah, yeah. that's where I started, right? So I would give us another 20 years. Uh, but basically the problem uh, there is this. Uh, are we talking about specifically treadmill? Like a treadmill, like a uh, machine? Oh. Or more like support hardware, like belt or whatever? I'm, I'm talking more about the headset. Oh, headsets. Yeah. Got it, got it. Yeah, so... I guess the problem there is this, right? Um, no matter what we try in this field, uh, Apple and Meta will do it much better, right? So there is a point in this whole kind of evolution where there will be specialized headsets, and maybe then we'll be able to piggyback of the existing technology and do something super light, just focused on one thing. Uh, but at this point, it's just um, going to be basically kind of, you know, probably a very risky strategy for us, given the expertise we're trying to kind of build, right? So, yeah, but yeah, it's a good question. We consider it, yeah. Mm -hmm. right? okay. one, one more question, okay? So, uh, I know from a social standpoint that uh, one of the challenges when you get a group of friends together and want to learn and all is how do you level set everybody's ability? Is there any sort of thought about how this might enable that? Yeah. So I, I can tell you about, like, the problem is that we can't really control the people, right? Personalities. And by controlling them, it may, it may be, like, a bad way of doing things, right? I can tell you about our AI, what we do now. Like, we have, for instance, competitive mode, and we have a peer mode. So basically, AI is going to follow you whatever you do, right? Whatever speed you're going at. So you feel good, you have a companion uh, and stuff like that. So in terms of people competing with each other, like, um, you know, obviously there are like things like ghost uh, runners, which we can enable so that people can train to be better. But I doubt we can artificially limit somebody's ability to be better than others. Yeah, yeah at least that's my initial. So, DJ, I know you have a question, but this lady is... Oh, oh, no, no, I was saying ah. just one more question. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, with the, the gaming question, is there an incentive, like, the longer people spend time in, do they get points and credits to, like, how do you download the fitness community or whatever? So there are uh, you mean, like, a natural progression within the application mm -hmm. that allows you to unlock cool stuff? So, it's an amazing idea we didn't get to implement. Yeah, right. So basically, the way you unlock is just by paying us. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, next up we have. Oh, I'll get to the next one. Yeah. Oh, wait, I went the wrong way. Sorry.
Um, yeah, that, that, uh, that's a fascinating. Okay, um, thanks, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I'm here to talk about Animation Next New York and any exchange, and particularly a project that uh, we worked on recently, and hopefully um, maybe it'll inspire you to uh, do a couple of community events. Um, it'll remind you, I think, that there are um, large groups of people all around the world who have not used VR at all, <laughs> and who it's like brand new for, you know what I mean? And I think sometimes we maybe lose sight of that. I mean, I was, I was, I don't know if it was pleasantly surprised. No, I wasn't. I was sad <laughs> at them, actually. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so as I mentioned, I'm the founder of Animation Nights New York. What that is is a, a festival since 2015. We've been curating uh, animation short form content from all around the world. Um, at this point, I'm connected to like over 20,000 animation teams, right? So short form content means uh, animated short films, but also VR and games. And I've been involved in the VR space for a while. In exchange is something that sort of grew organically from Animation Nights New York. Uh, what it is is a platform to connect creators with collaborators and distributors and create opportunity for them. We need a marketplace. <laughs> That's another conversation. Um, animation, as we all know, has impact and quality, high quality, and it, this is just a little bit of pitch for animation and in the exchange. Um, quality animation, there's no argument against it. Like it improves every single project, right? Whether it's a VR project or a game or a public space, um, it, it just, it helps, it makes everything better. A little visual. <laughs> we elevate the creator. <laughs> um, some of our clients, uh, you know, for any exchange, our clients are really real estate developers and galleries and educational institutions. Um, and we provide value for them through our relationship to talent, right? A little background. Uh, in, the, in the value we, we provide is uh, in the form of alternative di uh, distribution, experiential marketing, um, events, etc. And we curate all year round. So our festival is a monthly screening event uh, and an annual festival of movie work coming in all the time. So, this recent project that I did, I've been kind of involved uh, in the startup space with any exchange, right? So, pitching this platform. Now, I'm building, if you want to talk to me about that <laughs> and about collaboration, I would love to chat with you about it. Uh, but the, the project that I did with uh, Tech Incubator at Queens College, in partnership with uh, and New York Rose Together and any exchange, <laughs> we called it um, What the Hack Build a Better World, and it was a little hackathon of that. The point of it was really to just bring together early in the project pipeline entrepreneurs, small business owners, uh, uh, world builders, or even people who are interested in world building that want to like just try it for maybe the, for the first time, and then uh, some Queens College students who were interested in science. And you know the goal was to really like have 25 people <laughs> like all show up. You know what I mean? And do like a, an event. It was like. Like 2016 all over again. It was just beautiful. <laughs> so um, we did the, the the reason for it was to also um, uh, create an ideation around. Well, here this is the this is the questions that we asked. Uh, envisioning an interactive library experience. So it's sort of focused on the public library, something that is like community based, right? Um, and it was a good sort of uh, you know an open subject, but also uh, a problem that could be solved. I won't read the whole thing. So we met, we, uh, we had our groups, uh, you know, gave them an introduction, uh, put everyone at round tables. They built with uh, Mozilla Hubs and Lego and uh, a pencil and paper, and it was, everyone took it extremely seriously, <laughs> each team. Um, we had four or five different teams to solve this problem. You should explain Mozilla Hubs. I don't know if everyone oh, knows. Okay, sure, sure. So we used uh, <laughs> like this <laughs> thing that ties it to the actual subject, WebXR subject. So uh, yeah, I've just assumed everyone. Is Actually, how many people know and have used Mozilla Hubs? Mozilla Hubs. Okay. Okay. That's not bad. Right. Good. So my instincts weren't totally off, but a few people did. <laughs> so um, it's really. When the pandemic
pandemic first hit us all, and you know, I was doing in-person events, so I was just like, okay, well, we have to show everything. So what are the alternatives? Well, we had already done some hybrid in-person VR events, like High Fidelity, and um, I was looking into WebXR as a solution. So I was looking into A-Frame and 3JS, like we probably all were. And then, based on a recommendation, I think through LinkedIn, like Jimmy Pallet or some, somebody like, uh, mentioned something, um, I found uh, Mozilla Hubs and Mozilla Hubs Cloud. And so, at the time, we were just continuing this part, and I hope the community version is gonna be good, that they're supposed to, supposed to switch to. Um, you can sort of uh, host your own uh, version, host your own server, uh, host your own version of their, um, their platform. So we did that with AWS, and that's what we've been using. And because it was such a stable platform, we were doing events since December 2020, you know, and building worlds and using this thing, and it was such a great uh, tool. It was also a great starting point for a lot of people who weren't interested, or didn't necessarily know about what XR, because there's Spoke, right? There's the online editor that you can use to just like, use the architectural tools, build little rooms and things like that, and you didn't necessarily need to know how to code. So we got um, a large group of um, developers initially, and I held you know, learning tutorials leading up to this event, and then the people who were sort of left, <laughs> who were really, really interested and had time to participate, showed up. So they were our like, world builders, right? So um, in a span of like you know, three hours, they were, uh, solving these, uh, you know, these questions with Mozilla Hubs and Lego and uh, and Marker and, and Pen. And we had, you know, judges, cash prizes, it was catered. <laughs> but um, yeah, the end result is we had these teams with um, some, you know, serious solutions. Um, and the other part that I thought was very surprising is I just brought my own like little. Us too, and just showed demos that no one had seen any of the content. Like, um, it was wild. I mean, they were saying this for the very first time. Oh, I've heard about this, I'm not sure. And then a lot of the small business owners, I mean, part of the reason for all of this is to connect people early on, right? It's sort of like my mission statement for, for connecting animators to developers. Like, like get them at least knowing one another, so they have like a person that they can call, right? Um, so with this, we think that, you know, we hope that, you know, projects like these can help, you know, VR developers get hired, you know what I mean? As small business owners think about how they can uh, create practical use cases for WebXR for VR. It's really important. <laughs> so um, this was our winning team, uh, and, they uh, pitched a project that was related to um, uh, golf and public library and VR, and uh, they created a demo sort of walkthrough in Mozilla Hubs. Um, and phase two of the project is now uh, with a couple different iterations and pivots. <laughs> um, that's a sort of different story. The sort of one thing that did wind up happening, and I'll just share this with you because I think it's important is that when you have entrepreneurs, if you have people from the business space, and people from the academic space, and students, uh, the next question is like, it, it happens surprisingly early, but the entrepreneurs are like, who owns this? <laughs> <laughs> the IP, who owns this? And it, what's interesting is that the, a lot of the small business owners, again, they have not seen any of this technology. Not everyone, obviously, but I'm just saying, like, this seems to be something that kind of happens. So they're like, wow, this is brand new. Like, somebody's got a, who owns this, you know? And we're all kind of going, like, yeah, it's from 2014. You know what I mean? Like, seen that demo, like, I think. It's just interesting, you know what I mean? And the point of it is that, um, you know, as human beings, we silo. <laughs> and so to sort of break down barriers and communicate with one another, how do you do that when everyone's speaking a different language? You know? But it, it's an important task, and I think that you know I bring up even this little stumbling block, which you know we got over. But I had to go, whoa, we need to take a step back. It means we need to think about how we're going to incorporate a clear path for everyone, right? 
Um, at the same time, it's it's just it's necessary to do to move forward, really, to think about these things. So I don't know. It was all extremely exciting, and I'm really proud of, of our uh, event, and also um, even that we were able to sort of pivot and move forward. Um, yeah. So these are. Uh, having talked about that, this is uh, in exchange, Animation Nights in New York, and in virtual events, which is our VAV platform. But um, yeah, if you have any additional questions for me or you just want to chat, feel free to reach out. And um, yeah, thanks a lot, you guys. All right, we're going to skip to Mr. Ryan, who made the journey from Boston. Thank you so much for coming down. Hi everybody, thanks for having me. I did make the trip all the way from Boston. I didn't bring any Dunkin' Donuts with me, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a little bit better on our way. We put a little extra special stuff in it. Um, so uh, I run a company called Peppercore. Uh, we're a game development company. We're based um, just outside of Boston in a, in a city called Worcester, Massachusetts. And, uh, and so we've done a lot of different work. We have kind of two parts of the business, and this will just be kind of like a crash course in stuff that Petrocore has done. I wanted to share a bunch of work we've done. Uh, we do a lot of consulting work with outside clients, and then we also do original projects. So I'll just start with kind of our main original project, or I'll start with a little bit of background on the team, actually, just kidding. Uh, so we work with a lot of different platforms, Meta, Pico, Niantic, we've done a good bit with their Lightship platform. And I should say, you know, we've kind of started working in the VR space, but actually our background is really more in augmented reality. We've done a lot of work in that space. Um, we we're a partner with Snapchat. We did a big game with them that I'll share. And um, we got interested in VR when, when pass-through and mixed reality started becoming a part of the devices. So that got us really interested in that. That's actually kind of like, I think a lot of, you know, developers probably made the opposite jump. We kind of came to VR because of MR and AR. Um, so, I started the company, and then um, we started actually back in 2015, and we um, we all went to college together, and I, I roped in Oliver, who was the valedictorian of our class, and James, who would have been if he wasn't, and Christina, who was by far the most talented artist in our class, and then there was me, um, and all I was good at was just convincing really smart people to come and join me, and uh, we were able to start the company. And so we've been in business since 2015. We've done a lot of cool projects. Um, kind of our, our current big project is a game called Mythic Realms. I'm showing it over there. If anybody wants to try it, I will warn you, I'm down to one cleaning wipe. So anyone who plays <laughs> afterwards will get a lot closer with everybody here. Um, so Mythic Realms is an action RPG that we use mixed reality to transform your home into a fantasy world to battle monsters and gather resources for your growing VR kingdom. Basically what that means is kind of the loop to the game. You go out, we skin your room into a dungeon, you fight monsters, and you're tasked with building this kingdom from nothing. The way you build it is you get collect these resources from the monsters you defeat and the, the stuff you mine and the trees you chop down. That helps you build up the town. And then you go into the town uh, as you build it up, you get quests, and you go back out into mixed reality, and you can kind of send you to different themed dungeons from VR and skin your room in different ways. And so this is kind of a quick clip of the game working. So this is kind of from a little bit of an earlier version from the one that we're showing here, but basically, you know, this is part of how we introduce players to the game. Stuff comes in, and it's still early alpha. <laughs> Um, so there's still some walkiness to how it works, but it's really kind of physics based. You can knock things around. Um, uh, these are like different parts. So you can like trigger mining, and you can you can gather resources this way. Um, there's slimes that you fight, and they kind of split up as you fight them, and they get very chaotic and cutting down trees. Um, and so we want to have sort of boss fights and more encounters. Right now, we focus on just sort of a vertical slice, so a little bit of everything. This is the town designing, so you can really design your town, and then you can go into it in VR and walk around. And uh, this is where you pick up quests, and uh, you can craft stuff, and you get more powerful as a player, and then you can go back out into mixed reality from here. All right. Uh, so that's Mythic Realms. Um, the game that came before this, that really kind of uh, we learned a lot from that was like the first step to this was we did a game with Snapchat called Lens Detective. 
Um, so this was something we had come put in touch with them and they wanted the game to pitch. So we came up with a concept and pitched it and then they liked the idea and funded it. So it's a, it's a Pentacore game, sort of funded by Snapchat and running in a lens. The idea was uh, we wanted to basically place a crime scene in your room that you could then go and investigate. And we wanted like a really interesting use case for why it could be an AR. So you know you had to kind of like get around and like look under the table and really kind of like search through your space. You felt like you were like a real detective. And so uh, we put it out. It, it did well. It was it was played by a lot of people. And uh, and so this from this we learned a lot about kind of like mapping out the room and how people could play in a physical space. And so this was kind of where we started um, playing around with the idea of a game that occurs in your room. I think the whole game is about 15 megabytes because to fit in a snap lens, you have to be very, very small. So I am not a programmer. I can't tell you how the heck they did that, but they were able to get a lot of optics and it looks really nice for a Snapchat lens. Um, uh, on the client work side, so this is kind of more on the AR, not necessarily uh, VR side, but we did a uh, Burger King kids meal toy. So if anybody was going to Burger King's when this came out in December of 2019, I think, uh, you could get this. There was sort of an activity book that came with them, and they'd trigger it. And then there was a series of games they could play. So what you, you know, based on the book you got, you could go into these different dioramas. And it was a collaboration between Burger King and Animal Planet, weirdly enough, working together. Um, but the, you would get kind of different animals. And then there was also a runner game, and we used sort of a face lens, so your face movement where the character ran. Uh, we also worked on a, a really cool uh, augmented reality game. This was also with Niantic. The idea was, uh, it's, it's called Over Beasts, and it's basically that these sort of giant kaiju monsters are part of these various cities. And they're not really destroying your city, you're actually kind of helping nurture them, and then they're fighting each other. Um, so the group that did this has a filmmaking background that made this really great trailer, but like, it's, it's really cool, you kind of go around and gather stuff. It's done well, they, they worked uh, with Verizon and Niantic, and we helped do all the prototyping for this that sort of helped them get the funding. Uh, but it really, uh, it, 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 it was really cool when it came out, and, and they had kind of all these different cities in the US fighting against each other. Um, and you basically, you helped feed and grow the overbeast of your city, um, and get them powerful so that like, you know, if you were in Boston, you might fight up against, you know, uh, Detroit, and those two cities would battle each other, and whoever had a more powerful beast would win. Um, and then, it more kind of back towards the VR side, we've done some stuff with Horizon Worlds, um, Meta, and had uh, worked with us to basically design, we did this and then one other, um, so this was called Mob Quiz. Uh, it was a uh, very physical uh, quiz game where you voted with your feet. So you would wander around to one of four platforms. There were random questions that you got. The unique thing about this game was that the questions were based uh, both kind of on pop culture and history and your typical trivia questions. But then there were weird questions that were based on who was playing. So questions like, how many letter A's are in everybody's name that are currently in the room? Uh, and so then you have to kind of frantically try and look at everyone's names, count as many as you could, and run to the platform. If you were on the wrong platform, you'd get zapped, and then you'd lose. Uh, and it was kind of the last person standing would win. So the team worked on this in uh, the Horizon Worlds platform. They actually had to uh, uh, punch in every single question in a keyboard in VR. Um, I think they got like two or three hundred questions in, so I don't know, they, they, they can go insane doing that, but it was fun to work on, and then this um, had done well, so they came back and we did another one with them. It was kind of like a, a dodgeball game, uh, also in, in Horizon Worlds. Um, but yeah, that's Pepper just some background on kind of our current project and stuff that we're doing, and if anyone has any questions or wants to talk more, I'll be hanging out over there tonight, but thanks for having me.
animation industry, so uh, lots of crossover um, uh, with any uh, kind of projects. I uh, worked in the animation industry in New York for a long time and in the visual effects space. This is sort of a collection of, of various things I've worked on. I also have a, a studio with my friend Scott, who I met when I went to um, ITP. Uh, and we have been pretty focused on uh, various uh, XR projects over the last uh, 10 years or so. So this is a portfolio for this stuff. This is um, general purpose uh, advertising um, related kind of production work and, and some installation work as well. Some group VR experiences I did at NYU. Um, this is a uh, massive uh, multi-user uh, 600 person synchronized uh, VR experience uh, we did back in the days of cardboard. Um, something for the Economist, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, project uh, we worked on with uh, an artist named Damianski called Molar. Um, uh, something for a venue called uh, Elsewhere, a uh, multi-user project called Block, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so various and sundry. And more recently, I've been really interested in the healthcare space. Um, so, I've sort of been transitioning my uh, studio work and my client work to. Um, clients like um, Atai Life Sciences is one that I was working with recently. They're a psychedelic drug discovery company, and more recently I've been working with another company called Gilgamesh Pharmaceuticals. Um, I've been developing uh, interactive soundtracks for people who are going to be um, uh, taking a, an experimental psychedelic drug. Um, uh, I've also been working with a company, actually I need to replace this logo, they were called Rocket VR, and they've recently switched to uh, a Novo game, and they were recently out on the App Store. Um, I was doing a little work with them and the, um, the oncology space. Um, so, uh, just some, some, some various and sundry apps and projects for clients. This is a project called Dreaming, which came out on HTC's mobile headset, so I'm not sure if anybody will ever see it that day. <laughs> Uh, you can um, see it on uh, YouTube on um, other VR headsets. I made some uh, nice uh, stereo captures from that one. Um, and uh, the project that I'm going to talk about mostly today is a project that I'm sort of bringing into a sort of a new and uncharted territory, uh, somewhat uncharted. Uh, it's an app called Visitations, which, been, which has been out on the store for a while. And I've been recently um, yeah, and I have been uh, bringing that into the therapeutic space, and I've been doing uh, group sessions using visitation. So synchronized um, meditative sessions um, for uh, cat therapy or ketamine-assisted therapy. Um, so it was, uh, this app started off as an experimental project. It was sort of a bunch of like meditative vignettes that I was designing um, as, as art projects as I was learning how to, how to make XR. I was sort of like making spaces that I, I thought were nice to be in. Um, and I was introduced to a clinic in Manhattan called uh, Manhattan Restorative Health Sciences, which is actually just a few blocks away from here. So if you want to book a uh, ketamine infusion, um, you can do that and have an experience with visitation that's just a couple blocks away. Because um, I've got through some of this. One thing I didn't mention is luxury escapism, which I know some people experience here, but that was a project I did with uh, Tyler Bridget, and we took over a 4,000 square foot basement and filled it up with lots of different um, activations for the senses. So it was like some analog stuff, some digital stuff, a lot of VR. Um, one thing we had down there was a vibrating waterbed with a strobe light um, that was controllable and had binaural beats going. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that when I introduce the project I brought today. Um, this is what luxury escape of physical looks like. Um, so, yeah, this is how uh, Visitations got its start, just a collection of um, art experiences. Um, ketamine is a drug that's been around for quite a while. Um, it was used in Vietnam on, on, in, on the battlefield. Uh, it's very easy to anesthetize people and perform surgery in emergency situations. It's a very safe anesthetic. 
uh, you can set broken bones and like do all kinds of things. They still use it all the time. Um, they use it on kids, they use it on animals, it has the reputation as being a horse tranquilizer because it's also uh, used in uh, veterinary space as well. In the last 20 years, um, it's come to light that it actually has really powerful antidepressant effects, um, much more so than SSRIs and lots of other treatments for certain kinds of depression. Um, but for depression that ketamine works with, it works extremely well. Um, so the idea with uh, visitations is that it was meant to be basically a better setting than a clinic. So people go in, they get these uh, infusions, and they're just like a fluorescent room, and it might not be that nice. And like a lot of people who are administering these don't necessarily care about what kind of experience you're having, what the space looks like, what it smells like, and things like that. So by creating VR experiences, people don't have to completely redecorate the space that they're in. Um, set and setting is a term that was coined by Timothy, Timothy Leary, and basically the idea is that um, psychedelics are a sort of uh, non-specific enhancer of um, uh, sensations. Uh, so if you're not in a nice place, and if your head isn't in a nice place, you're not going to have a good time on psychedelics. So the idea with this project is to pretty much create a nicer place for people to be. Um, so uh, some, some UX design considerations are uh, there's very little interaction. Uh, we didn't want to have to train people how to do anything. Uh, we gave people a button so they could switch scenes. Um, it automatically reorients so they can sit up, they can recline, they can lie all the way down. Um, and there is, uh, with the newest version, there's some options for customizing the experience beforehand so people can choose which scene they might want to be in and like, uh, get their own soundtrack in there and things like that. Um, so these are, you know, some qualities that um, uh, I'm trying to work into the experience. So awe uh, turns out to be a very powerful healing modality, and, and like awe is defined as basically uh, experiencing something that's bigger than yourself and sort of like growing into it. So like the overview effect. Let's say astronauts go up into space and they look back down on the Earth and they're just like amazed that you know we sort of live on this like single thing and they have to like adjust their frame of reference themselves to that. So uh, there's some interesting research that came out uh, specifically around awe and VR and how powerful VR is uh, for creating experiences of awe. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these other things more specifically, but we can talk about any of those. Uh, more recently, I, um, I came across a study where they showed that um, Nature is very therapeutic. Going out and looking at trees like makes people feel better, and it turns out that digital nature uh, works just as well. In this one particular study that was uh, from Northern Europe and somewhere. Um, so, can you talk about entrainment as a healing modality? Uh, yeah. So we're on this page now. The first one came up was visual strobing. So um, uh, different states of mind are associated with different brain waves. Uh, so like 10 hertz is associated with uh, alpha waves, uh, which are associated with uh, focus and attention, sort of like calm attention. We're going to stay in waves in like the three to four hertz range is associated with sleep. Um, I've heard different things about like what, like what really experienced meditators can do in terms of brain waves. Um, I've heard that um, they're like really good at getting right into 40 hertz brain waves. Uh, it turns out that uh, stimulation at 40 hertz can help break up amyloid plaques and rats, and so there's actually devices that are being released now that throw and make sounds at 40 hertz to help prevent Alzheimer's, um, maybe allow you to live longer. Uh, so yeah, the effect of strobing, um, it, it sort of creates this effect that shows up on an EEG, and there's a suggestion among some manufacturers of high-end strobe lights, uh, some of which can go for you know, upwards of $25,000, that by strobing lights in your eyes at certain frequencies, you can, you, it, it can kind of put you into these um, states that can be therapeutic. So um, uh, I'm going to finish this presentation and come back to the strobing. Uh, but these are some of the ideas that I sort of brought into the design of visitation. So strobing is an important one uh, that goes along with binaural beats as well. Uh, tunnels and spirals are things that just sort of help people focus. I didn't want there to be any confusion about where to look. I wanted it to be very easy on the eyes. These things are just very easy on the eyes. Uh, symmetry.
country, central focus are things that are sort of not so interesting from an artistic perspective. It's like you go to art school, the first thing you learn is like don't make things symmetrical. But from the perspective of just like making an easy going, like calm place for people to be, uh, I find that people like giving people a very clear sense of what to look at and having that be in the easiest place for their eyes to rest uh, works really nicely. Um, having things that change at different speeds gives people a way to bring their attention continuously back to it. Um, you don't want things to just like sit there and, and not change. Like I've seen you know, meditation apps where you're on the beach and like the beach is supposedly relaxing, but you wind up like looking off at this like flat horizon of like blue on blue and like nothing's really happening. Uh, personally, I don't find that particularly relaxing. But if the if things are sort of like changing at different rates and it sort of you know works like in the same way that my breathing works and it, if it is always like bringing my attention back, um, that does help me relax. So you know I've been trying to design around some of those ideas. Um, let's see. So just a few of these. Uh, so I'm going to come back to this. Uh, the black and white images here are called um, Kluver forms, and they were uh, originally described by Eric Kluver in the 1920s when he was doing uh, research on himself with mescaline. And these are the kinds of um, visual hallucinations that would come up in that space. It turns out that you also see very similar patterns when you strobe lights in your closed eyes. So again, something else I'll come back to uh, when I'm operating today. Um, so these are all sort of design principles from presentations. Um, fine oral beats work the same way as visual strobing. I've uh, been working with um, a musician named East Forest. We actually just released a video uh, with a voiceover by Duncan Trussell, who is the voice for um, uh, Midnight Gospel. Um, so if you look up uh, So What, Duncan Trussell, East Forest, it's like a 10 minute AI generated music video. Actually, can I get a quick show of hands? I've been I spent most of the last year uh, working with Stable Diffusion and like controlling it from Unity and like sort of like you know getting a lot of control using ControlNet and just like I've been pretty deep in it and I've been thinking about doing a workshop for people like with how to use eForum and like automatic 1111 and stuff like that. Quick show of hands who'd be interested in a workshop like that? Oh gosh, okay, so maybe I should do that. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so something that is really um, interesting to me about exploring uh, these group sessions is cost and accessibility. Um, a ketamine infusion at a clinic is like $600 or $800 and you have to get five or six of them. So by doing it in a group and sort of standardizing this experience means that it's going to be a lot easier to take to lots of different locations and keep the price down. And then you can go with friends. And part of the process of um, this kind of therapy is integration and community and, and sharing these experiences with people so that you can go have these experiences with friends and people you know, they can be more powerful, potentially. Um, so these are uh, some, some clients I've been working with. I did a study with Johns Hopkins. Uh, they were uh, testing different settings using VR for um, some research they were doing with psilocybin and Alzheimer's. Uh, Penn was the um, study with um, radiation therapy. Um, and uh, there's more stuff I need to add to the slide for the future. Uh, and so I'll talk about what I brought here today. Uh, so in terms of this entrainment thing, um, I was going to Burning Man this year, Bloody Man. Uh, and last year I brought out some VR to share with people, and it was hard um, to do that. I wanted to bring HTC Flows, which actually worked really well out there, because I was able to put six into like a pretty small Back, you know, like so. Uh, so it was, it was on the easy side, but still hard to do stuff with VR. So I wanted to bring something that would be sort of similarly interesting and have kind of a similar form factor. So um, I designed uh, some uh, some strobe lights. Um, I originally came across this like strobe light effect at Maker Fair. Somebody had designed these like sort of you know cheap. Uh, glasses you put on and they strobe lights in my eyes and I saw these like crazy patterns and they were called trip goggles and I was like, oh, this is weird, what's going on with this? So I did some research and I've, I've had a chance to 
like look at lots of different kinds of high-end strobe lights that are designed for therapy. There's a few places in New York you can go do them. There's a place on Second Second. I forget the name of that place. Uh, they have a, a five thousand dollar strobe light you can go look at. There's another place called Flolo in uh, Midtown, uh, not too far from here. Um, it has another uh, Oxia strobe light. So there are these companies that, that put out these strobe lights. They're anywhere from five to twenty-five thousand dollars. They pair them with music and they sort of like bring you through these like different stages of these experiences. And there's an aspect to it where it's just like it's kind of cool because it's like the patterns that you see behind your closed eyes are just like are really pretty. And it turns out the longer that you focus and the longer that you meditate on them, the more you pay attention to them. That actually the act of focusing changes your brain waves and the the patterns that you see are like nobody's exactly sure where they come from, but there was a study that came out where the suggestion was that the patterns you see are the result of entrainment to some degree. So when you're focusing on them a lot, you're sort of increasing these brain waves that the strobe lights are also attuned to. So if you if you want to experiment, you can try out these strobe lights that I have here. The longer you sit there and the more you focus on them, the more interesting the patterns uh, become. Um, uh, there's there's more to the history of like strobe lights with therapy and art. Uh, William S. Burroughs and Brian Tyson developed uh, a device called a uh, Dream Machine, which is a uh, record player with like a, a column with holes cut out that would spin around and then strobe lights in your eyes. Uh, some of the earliest studies in psychedelic therapy were done with strobe lights. Um, I have a great quote somewhere from Stanislav Krop, uh, who's like a psychologist who worked the psychedelic space, and he, like the first time he ever did LSD was in a study where they were strobing lights in his eyes, and he just described this like incredible experience in that combination. So um, that particular combination is also like uh, interesting to explore uh, at some other time, not today. <laughs> um, so. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I brought that, so I just made my own, I made it with an Arduino, it's like low ends, you know, it's like higher end headsets are $100, $500, and $20,000, this is like the $5 version, but it, it gets, it's going to give you like, um, you know, 90% of like what the experience is, it's like the difference between a low end strobe light and a high end strobe light is like, you know, the difference between $100 whiskey and $20 whiskey, it's all whiskey, and so that's all going to get you drunk. So you're going to have like, some, some sense of what it's like. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share that because I think it's cool and interesting. It's not like a product and it's like, I'm not you know, doing this as like part of my job or anything. I just thought it was like a fun, cool thing to bring to Burning Man and I, I brought that here today. So you can, you can try that out later. So that's some of what I'm working on. Uh, thank you.
you know, the DEA is paying more attention to it now because it's become a lot more popular. But basically, any doctor who prescribes it is going to have a different idea about the right way to do it. But it's like five or six sessions, like once a week or so, or maybe twice a week is like pretty standard. But is that the best way? Um, gotcha. So okay. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about um, somebody has epileptic seizures or. So with strobe lights, definitely, if anybody here has epilepsy, do not do the strobe light experience. Because um, yes, that will, like, the entrainment that it causes, like, does cause seizures. Yeah. Um, and with uh, my particular VR experience, there are some scenes that have, like, a little bit more um, uh, activation, like, with, with strobing. Uh, so I do recommend just generally, like, you know, people who have that, like, not do it. PTSD is a totally different thing. Um, and there's like lots of different therapies for PTSD. Uh, there's lots of um, uh, you know VR experiences that are designed specifically for PTSD, and that's not something that I have worked on at all yet. It's like uh, like there's a lot of exposure therapy that people do specifically for PTSD. We'll have lectures as well. Uh, with ketamine and the VR Um, very rarely. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not too common. Ketamine in general is like um, it's much shorter acting, um, and sort of not. It's it's like it is like people describe it as a psychedelic, but it's not psychedelic in the same way that, that mushrooms or LSD or some of those things are. Um, and it's uh, it's definitely possible to have bad experiences, but much less common than some of the other ones. What about cables? Yeah, <laughs> cables are, are famous in that list. Um, yeah, I mean, cable doesn't necessarily, I mean, as my understanding is that doesn't necessarily mean like bad experience, it's just like how associated are you, so um, clinics will give people anywhere from like a half a milligram per kilogram to a milligram per kilogram uh, IV, and that like a milligram per kilogram dose like does tend to like get people like right to the edge of being like pretty fully dissociated to the point where maybe they're not going to remember. Uh, aspects of what their experience was like, like that. But the the amount that they give people to do surgery on them is like five times more than that. Um, so it's still so much less than they would give people in like other situations. So um, yeah, my doctor friends describe giving ketamine to kids to like set their broken bones, and it's like they just like go to this like other world and they have this trip, and it's like they aren't necessarily expecting it or prepared for it. But um, yeah, ketamine brings them. Um, I mean, high doses doesn't necessarily equal bad trip. Um, I think like bad, bad situations and like maybe bad preparation, or it's like if you're, you know, it's like if you're on the way to the hospital and they like poke you with a needle and like you know you're like extremely stressed out about something. I mean, I've also like had people describe to me like in those situations like having a wonderful time on the way to the hospital, like having their bone set and like being on like, a lot of heavy. Um, but you know, I've also heard people describe going to clinics where it's like everything is supposed to be like really like set up really nicely and everything is taken care of and they still have a bad trip. But I think again, like compared to other things, it's um, much less likely that people have bad trips. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.